up guys otterpop here this is another analysis slash commentary of a little bit something closer to forensic and science related material i've asked a lot of times over recent months you know of what kind of material people wanted to see from me and surprise surprise art and forensic content were kind of at the lowest end of the poll bars ratings but i don't care i don't give a crap because those two subjects mean so much more to me than most of the other stuff reactions don't care as much as people would think. Gaming, I enjoy it, but you know, meh. And compilations, I enjoy that, but they are a pain in the arse to make. But art and forensics have been with me longer than YouTube ever has been. They are very important to me. And I want to try making some more of my own original content as well as some, you know, commentary analysis on various YouTube videos. And some of the videos that were suggested to me were by this YouTube creator named Sam Onella Academy, which I have heard of before, but I don't think I've ever seen any of their videos before. And they so happen to have a two-parter called Dead Body Hijinks. And I thought that that seemed immensely fascinating. I love anatomy and I love taphonomy, which is the study of decomposition. And the idea of those two kind of clashing, as I imagine Sam is going to be talking about, the various uses of dead bodies over the centuries that sounds incredibly fascinating to me and i can provide a forensic and scientific perspective on it as well so that is what i'm going to do there's two of these videos they're like seven eight minutes each so i will just watch both of them and i will see what kind of commentary and analysis i can provide for both of these because this kind of material is very much up my alley especially if they if we're talking about independent creators and animators on the youtube platform which are grossly underappreciated in my opinion thanks to dashlane for sponsoring this video if this guy has any ad breaks i'll leave him dead body hijinks hey part kids. one whether you're a precocious young lad down by the swimming hole or a grizzled <laughs> crime scene investigator everybody's got some interest in dead bodies yes from weekend at i bernie's definitely do to weekend at bernie's 2 to weekend at bernie's 3 revelations stories about wayward corpses have certainly carved their niche in today's media so i thought i'd spin a few yarns about some real life people who were kept out far past their expiration date our first tale follows one <laughs> elmer mccurdy he was an outlaw oh, during the familiar. twilight days of the wild west <laughs> Thanks to his former life as a miner, McCurdy acted as the demolitions expert to his little posse, mm. using nitroglycerin basically any time he had the faintest excuse to do so. Except, he was kind of a moron, so it didn't usually go quite as planned. Gotta say, after peanut butter and chocolate, my favorite combination of two things is probably gross incompetence and high explosives. Exactly. In March of 1911, McCurdy's oh, band of rabble rousers found out that $4,000 were in a safe in an approaching train. They managed to stop the entire locomotive. I don't even know how you do that break in hold everyone on board hostage and locate the safe mccurdy steps up to play right gotta blast the thing open except okay. i guess the excitement kind of got to him because he ended up using like way too much nitroglycerin like inordinate amounts ended up completely destroying mm. the safe and its contents and what few silver coins they made out with were literally melted to the frame of the safe and had to be mm. peeled off anyway he died in a shootout with police later that year and the undertaker <laughs> at the funeral home he was sent to couldn't find any next of kin on account of mccurdy being oh. a ramble and low life oh, varmint. So he just embalmed the hell out of him and said, Hey, boys and girls, want to see a dead criminal? Only one shiny nickel. <laughs> and since Live Leak wasn't around at the time, oh, there geez. weren't many places a kid could go to stare at a corpse for a while if he or she so desired. So it actually became a pretty popular attraction. Visitors would pay their dues by physically slipping the coin into the man's mouth, and the oh. creepy-ass undertaker would come fish him out later, probably with bare hands all slowly and sensual-like. Oh. A few years passed when a couple of guys showed up claiming to be McCurdy's brothers with a note from the local sheriff to back it up. They Ooh. told the undertaker they had permission to go bury McCurdy, so he reluctantly relinquished the body to the men except these guys weren't his brothers they were just a couple of crusty freaking carnies they shipped the body uh. off to kansas to become an attraction in the traveling show oh. from here mccurdy traded hands a few more times at one point he was exploited for this one guy's film about narcotics it was like yeah this oh. pill popping degenerate got shot while trying to rob a pharmacy for more dope the other day the body <laughs> was super old by then so people are like wait why is he all desiccated and flaky and gross he just goes yep yeah, that's what happens when you do drugs kids you're Fucking skin falls oh, off. Geez. Stay above the influence. Okay, so first off, the fact that this guy died in a shootout and not from some explosive-related injury, 
I'm not sure what I would call that situation, but that's actually really funny. Also, the fact that skin will slog off of a decomposing body, it'll happen whether there are drugs in the system or not, or whether the body is intoxicated with drugs or not. That's a normal part of the decomposition process. Skin is essentially tissue. Matter of fact, it's not even just one layer of tissue, it's essentially three layers of tissue that's all woven together very intricately and covers the entirety of your body. And because it's biological material, it is subject to decompose like any other organic material. Eventually, once your body decomposes enough, the only things that are ever usually remaining on your body are going to be bone and maybe little bits of keratin and cartilage, but primarily bone. But yes, the, the skin will decompose and slog off normally, again, whether you have drugs in your system or not. I think in some cases there are certain kinds of drugs that don't necessarily speed up the process but can attract certain kinds of insects. I don't remember exactly what kinds of drugs, but I, I, I think that's really the only major effect that most drugs will usually have on a decomposing body is that certain drugs will just attract certain kinds of insects, thereby sometimes speeding up certain stages of decomposition. So, yeah. At some point in his journey, he ended up getting coated in wax and paint to look a little less rotty, before ending up in a warehouse in 1949. Here's the thing, he was in there alongside some actual wax figures, and after spending 19 years in storage, nobody knew he was a real corpse anymore, so he ended up getting sold in 1968 Ooh, as a dear. mannequin to one Spoony Singh, owner of the Hollywood Wax Museum. He tried to lend the guy out a couple <laughs> times during his stay, but people oh, found dear. him too gross or unrealistic looking for whatever purposes they had in mind. <laughs> So he ended up getting sold Too again and used huh? as a prop of a hanged man at the Pike Amusement Zone oh. in their funhouse ride, with oh, zero no. knowledge that he was an actual dead criminal. It oh, wasn't dear. until 1976, 65 years after his death, that an episode of The Six Million oh. Dollar Man was being filmed at the complex, and a stagehand tried to move the prop around, only to have its arm break off in his hand. He was like, ugh, lousy stiff. Wait a minute, that's curious. This mannequin's got human flesh and bones inside of it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. The autopsy confirmed what everyone present at the time suspected. By this point, the oh, body geez. was so dried out and stale that oh, it only weighed 50 pounds. Which makes me think, we should start a radical new fad diet where we just get people to mummify wow. parts of their body. Like, Jenny, guess what? I just lost 30 pounds in five days. Wow, holy heck, how'd you do that? They call it the Egyptian cleanse. Anyway, with that, McCurdy was finally laid to rest back wow. in his homeland of Oklahoma, and that film crew's pounds. lives were never the same again. Flashback to late 18th century, Damn, baloney. there lived a physician by the name of <laughs> Luigi Galvani. This guy was a big okay. deal. He's the dude who discovered that, hey, animals got electricity in them. And his legacy still survives kind today of. in words like galvanize. One of his most famous experiments was the one where he used uh, static electricity legs. to make frog legs twitch on command. Around these parts, we mm -hmm. call that the French salute. Ha <laughs> ha, stereotypes funny. So funny enough, salt has a very similar reaction on frog legs like ju ju just frog legs no joke the sodium that's in salt i mean that's mostly what salt is is a you know a lot of sodium but the sodium ions will react with muscle nerves in in frog legs and it, it will send a sort of false signal that causes like involuntary spasms in frog legs but it, it, it's very similar and, and that's kind of how electricity works because well, at least electric signals, I suppose I should say, at least in terms of the nerves themselves. Because the nerves do send their own sort of unique electric signals, and that's 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 what allows me to move in this strange way. <laughs> and allows me to basically talk and, you know, to balance myself and to look at the camera. It, it, there are so many things that are controlled by by the incredible interaction of nerves with special electrical signals, especially with brain cells. But yeah, sodium ions, in certain cases, can trick certain kinds of muscle fibers to react as if they're getting a signal from the brain itself. It's kind of cool. Well, in 1803, his nephew, Giovanni Aldini, said, Hey, that's pretty nifty and all, but uh, what if we tried it on people? 
So the city of London was like, oh, hey, now you're thinking with portals. One freshly executed criminal coming up. Aldini gathered a crowd and applied two diodes yep. to the corpse's head, causing his face to scrunch up and one eye to flick open. Aldini was a showman, though. He wanted some real action. So he then <laughs> put the current through opposite points in the body, which made the whole thing flail around like Pinocchio in heat. Now, yeah. today we know he was just exciting the dead muscles, right? But the people who were watching yeah. had no idea what was going on. So they nope. were like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a fucking neck. Necromancer. Quick, go get grandma. Maybe we can get in the will after all. Fun fact, this experiment actually ended up serving as inspiration for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Which oh, that's, makes me wonder okay, what other gotcha. famous novels were based on real life events. Was a white whale ever pursued by a vengeful sea captain? Was there actually a mentally handicapped migrant worker who liked hugging rabbits to death? Was there ever a human soul as profoundly asinine and willfully ignorant as Amelia Bedelia? God, I hate her glassy-eyed face so fucking much. I just want to mash it into a running waffle maker. Be like, ha, huh, isn't that wow. ironic? Grab her by her vacant so fucking geez. head. Throw her out of a 747 and say, hey, why didn't you shoot yourself when you had the chance? Get it! Yeah, when it came to dead bodies over the centuries, there were, there was a lot more... Oh, that, that's kind of an interesting topic, actually, because there was some more leniency when it came to how dead bodies were used for science and medical purposes, but at the same time there were still rules against it. I do remember reading in some texts that for a long time it was okay to do all kinds of anatomical and scientific experiments on the corpses of like criminals and convicts. That wasn't quite as frowned upon. It still wasn't, it still didn't sit well with a lot of citizens, so there would be plenty of people that would acquire bodies and corpses in secret and do all kinds of research on them. I can't remember the name of one guy somewhere, maybe in London or London adjacent, who did that. Um, he was a, he was a pretty nasty guy though in terms of some of the experiments he conducted on some of the corpses, holy crap. Actually, I'm gonna nip, I'm gonna look through some of my books. Because I know I've read it relatively recently. Hang on. Okay, so it took me a few minutes, but I think I finally um, found the guy that I was looking for. I actually can't believe Okay, so Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers. Awesome book. There is literally an entire chapter, Body Snatching and Other Sordid Tales from the Dawn of Human Dissection. There is an entire chapter dedicated to how people viewed body snatching, unearthing dead bodies, and the very concept of just general human dissection across um, a few centuries for sure. But the guy that I was referring to that I couldn't exactly remember was Sir Astley. Yeah, he would sometimes operate on people and he kept in touch with the family doctors of those he had operated on and, upon hearing of their passing, commissioned his resurrectionists to unearth them so that he might have a look at how his handiwork had held up. So he operated on people, and once they died, he asked other people to dig up their corpses so that he could look at them and see how his own work held up when he originally operated on them. What? So yeah, the idea of unearthing corpses and doing illegal body snatches has definitely been um, a contentious topic for a very long time. There are many more rules and regulations now regarding matters such as that. It, it, was, it was kind of interesting because for a long time there, there, there was a combination of some leniency and some moral objection to those kinds of practices. I know the human body needed to be studied, but man, there were not very easy ethical ways to do that, and they definitely were not regulated back then. Anyway, one thing we learned today is the importance of reputability. And just as you wouldn't want some dirty carnies jacking your stiff, phrasing, <laughs> you certainly wouldn't want the same fate to befall your valuable online information. That's why you need to try Dashlane. Dashlane's been all over the place ah. recently, and with good reason. In this day and age, cybersecurity and privacy have never been more important, and only a select true. few people have Very the time, true. energy, and know-how to keep <laughs> their data as safe as humanly possible. What Dashlane does is, it takes all do your better, passwords and autofill data across all around. your devices and uses the power of encryption to keep them out of the encryption. hands of lowly hackers. PC, Mac, <laughs> iOS, Android, Chrome, Safari, 
Firefox, doesn't matter, Dashlane's got your back. Something especially cool about it is that you I can automatically so. change your passwords right in Dashlane without fiddling with stupid security questions from six years ago you don't know <laughs> the answer to for an hour. Dashlane yeah. Premium even comes Fair. with a VPN, so now you can take full advantage oh, of unsecured Wi-Fi without ever with worrying well, that the janitor that in sense. the back of Starbucks knows about those horrific purchases you're making. So please, go to Dashlane.com slash Salmonella to try Dashlane Premium oh, free so for 30 days. Salmonella. Also, the first 200 people <laughs> Use so the promo bad. code it's one letter away. We get ten percent off their so Dashlane no. Premium subscription. <laughs> By the way, this video ended up being oh way too goodness. long, so stay tuned for part two in a week or two. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Manella, and thank you for watching. That that was part one. That didn't have as many stories as I thought it would, but that was still very interesting and entertaining in its own way. And I was able to provide some of my own analysis and commentary and introduce people who are interested in dead body hijinks. This lovely title of a book. I mean, it sounds and looks kind of um, morbid, and it can be, but at the same point, it's not like there are any graphic images in here. I mean, there's graphic information for sure, but there's there's a lot of interesting interesting truth to the various parts of our history of the world and, you know, how human cadavers even work. I mean, and this is just one of the many forensic and cadaver related texts that I have. I have I have a bunch more, but this one right here is definitely one of my favorites. It's a it's a must read for sure. So anyways, that was part one. I'd love to hear some more stories in part two and see if I can't offer a little bit more insight. Let's see. Hey kids, time to talk about so. more cases of stiff lifting from the days of yore. <laughs> if you haven't seen part one yet, go check it out. Or Already don't. Did. I'm Just a YouTuber, did. not a cop, unfortunately. <laughs> this first tale doesn't feature an entire dead body, but I still found it interesting enough to talk about. So one day in 2012, a priest was oh, riding a train out of Italy when his bag got stolen by a trio of thieves. <laughs> Inside the bag was oh, whatever boy. normal personal possessions the guy happened to own, as well as a small vial containing the blood of none other than Pope John Paul II. So oh. this begs the question, why did the priest have Pope blood in his bag? Well, an important that way that question. the Catholic Church honors saints and other venerable rated individuals is the keeping of relics. These relics are ranked in terms of how close they were to the person at hand. You got something that's tangentially related to a saint in any way? That's a third class relic. If it's a oh. personal possession of a saint, it's second class. And as for first oh. class relics, those typically consist of literal body parts and or fluids of a holy figure. Say. Now for you youngsters out there, in 1981 the Pope got shot four times by some fascist having a bad day. People are like, holy shit, it's a pope aside. Is that even a word? <laughs> no, no, I'm okay. Oh. Say, who left all this first-class relic lying around? So to this day, there remain three <laughs> objects containing the fine-aged poppy juice spilled that fateful afternoon. The vial was found wow. a few hours later by police among the reeds and grass near the station, which basically huh. means the thieves took one look at it and were like, Pfft blood? I already make this myself. Lame. And Wouldn't toss it out without a second even thought. Has, Here's the thing though, that's Priest not the only that. instance of old JP2 getting blood napped. In 2014, a similar that's relic not the was only case? from the church of San Pietro della Yenca in Italy alongside a crucifix. Oh my goodness. The fact that these were the only items taken led to two prevailing theories. Some people thought that since John Paul II wasn't technically a saint yet, the relic's value would go way up once the man was actually canonized. So the thieves decided to take it now and resell it later. The other theory was was way more popular with the media. After all, what okay. use does Pope blood have other than satanic rituals? <laughs> this story naturally got a lot of press, and the whole world just kind of assumed that Lucifer himself was set to return any day now. Eventually, okay. the thieves confessed, so authorities came to the rehab facility they were staying at. They returned the cross, but when questioned about the relic, they were like, wait, what? Pope blood? Satan? Do you guys need to check in here too? <laughs> Eventually, it was found in a rubbish bin on the facility oh, grounds, which means once again, it was just casually tossed out as nonsense. You ever throw I out mean... pope blood? Because apparently, multiple people have done that on separate occasions just in the past seven years. Right. It doesn't end there, of course. Wild. In 2016, oh, this happened God. a third time when a piece of cloth with John Paul fluid on it was taken from Cologne Cathedral. I can't for the life of me find a follow-up to this story, which leads me to believe that they're just like, fuck it, pope blood's more trouble than it's worth at this point. But if you guys can 
can find some conclusion I mean, where it ended up. Let me know below. Now, our next story begins with a man named <laughs> yeah, Carl Tanzler, a German-born radiology that. technologist in Ooh, early 20th century Florida. He looked kind of like Sigmund Freud, <laughs> except even more evil looking. On the inside, he was a pretty normal dude, other bit. than the fact that he claimed to have visions throughout his life of some oh, mysterious dark-haired girl. Boy. Anyway, in 1930, while working at the Marine Hospital in Key West, he met a young woman by the name of Maria Elena Miracolo de Hoyos, called Elena for short, and he said, uh, okay. Oh my god, that's a girl from the visions I've been having. <laughs> yeah, she- Wait, what? We were meant to meet today. <laughs> we must be soulmates. What? Don't you have, like, a wife and two kids? Destiny. <laughs> Hoyos was soon diagnosed with tuberculosis, which was considered oh. fatal at the time, so naturally, yep. Carl decided to handle her treatment, going as far as convincing her family to let him visit their home every day. Except, he was a radiologist, so even if there were reliable means to treat tuberculosis at the time, he definitely didn't have the credentials to do so. But no. whatever. This is the past we're talking about, after all. It's that place true. was a shit show from start to finish. I'm not about to get on somebody's case for a little I mean, true. Error. In addition to whatever <laughs> salves and tinctures and such doctors gave to people back then, and Tansler showered her with gifts of clothes and jewelry. I know he meant well, but if I was bedridden with a terminal illness, I'd just be insulted. Like, wow, thanks, can't wait to show off this little number I'd out on the town. Out. Anyway, eventually, Tansler found that the time had come to reveal his true feelings. Elena, there's something I must confess. And she died. I, I'm deeply in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you feel the same. Oyos inevitably succumbed to the disease, leaving Tansler heartbroken. He just wasn't it's ready to part ways with his in pestilence the 1900s. riddled sweetheart. So he asked the family's permission the to commission an above-ground yeah. mausoleum for their daughter. And since this was oh. the early 20th century, they said, Yep. Ah, what a sweet, selfless man. I'm sure he'd never do this just so he could commit crimes against nature. Then he was like, oh yeah, by the way, could I have some of her hair too? Sure, kind stranger. Here's a bag of her hair we just had lying around for some fucking reason. Again, no red flags here. He went to visit Jeez. her dwelling nearly every night for two years. Then finally one day he said, you know what, kid? You're all right. Say, how's about we dish this musty old mausoleum and go back to my place? <laughs> I'll take that as a he didn't yes. He did did he? So he took her home in a little red toy wagon, which is ridiculous. It makes me picture him skipping around, whistling a merry tune. Hey, neighbor! Now here's a riddle for all you intellectuals out there. What do a dead body and a used PT Cruiser have in common? Sure, they both taste terrible, and you never want to be seen in public with one. Most importantly, though, they're a depreciating asset. But hey, that didn't stop old Gnarly Carly from sprucing her up any way he could, wiring her bones back together with coat hangers, replacing oh, her skin with wax and silk, making a wig out of that bag of hair from earlier, and oh, soaking the body word. in massive amounts of perfume and disinfectants, for obvious reasons. He claimed to have been instructed to do all this by Elena's spirit, which he would apparently talk to From frequently. The he also did, you know, that thing eccentric loners do with dead ladies in their house, but we won't talk yep, about that. This get. went on for seven years, seven hot and humid Jeez. Florida years, until 1940 when Elena's sister saw him dancing with some lady through the curtains. She's like, aw, how cute. I'm glad that old bag of lentils has finally found love. Walks uh. in. Comes to find out, it's her fucking dead sister. So the cops come, but there isn't any conclusive evidence of any flirting and philandering with the body, so the only crime Carl could have been charged with was grave robbing. Except, the statute of limitations was already up by the time he was found out, so they just took the body, tipped their hats, and went on their merry way. Tansler still missed Elena dearly, but since he couldn't have her cadaver, he crafted a crude homemade effigy of the lady, oh, of which he lived he with for the rest of his life. Here's the part that really gets me, though. He apparently went back to live with his estranged wife once the jig was up. Just like, hey babe, I know we haven't talked since the whole corpse what? thing, but uh, I've been having trouble making rent. Do you think I could come crash for a while? Sure, come right in. I'll take your coats. Would you and the demented life-size replica of your long-dead lover that you left me for like a cup of tea? I'd like one. None for her, though. It goes right through Just her. Just poison him. Just poison him. Of course, I'm making all this out to be a horrifying thing for the goofs and gaffs of it. But at the time, a lot of people read the news stories about Tansler, and many actually sympathized with the man. They saw him as the distraught, hapless romantic that he saw himself as. You know why they had that compassion? Because they listened. Say, what would the world look like if we all <laughs> listened more? Sponsor time. There, Listening there to audiobooks limits, inspires us. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna let his little, uh, his little ad or what, whatever play out. But like, what in the? I, I know that people probably listened and empathized with him, but I still fail to understand how. Granted, I am not an emotional person. Not very. I am very logical with a lot of things, so emotional states, 
I don't always understand. I I don't have many emotional reactions myself. I'm I'm aromantic asexual. I have no interest in romanticizing or in in romance or sex or anything like that cuz that doesn't interest me cuz I'm I'm not super in tuned with my emotions and whatnot. I, I'm in tune with my brain. That's about it. What kind of thought process does someone go through when they see an old man basically dancing and flirting with a body that has been dead for years? How, even back then, how could that possibly be justified? In the early-ish to mid-ish, not quite, 1900s? That makes no sense. I know that people have done weird things with dead bodies. I freaking call out this book again. I have read what people have done with dead bodies and, you know, the experiments performed, the weird, morbid stuff that people have done, and the, the, the inexcusable stuff as well. But how do you look at somebody in the situation and think that that's morally, logically, sane? I... yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Say, what would the world look like if we all listened more? Sponsor time! <laughs> Listening to audiobooks inspires two ears us, and motivates us, reason. even brings us closer. And there's no better place to listen than Audible. How many Audible. arms do you have? Well, what should you listen to, you oh, ask? Audible. After okay, all, gotcha. there's so many options that it's almost overwhelming. Well, normally, I tell you to go listen to my book, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. I've never written a book. So instead, how about the Necronomicon? <laughs> That's right. The Necronomicon is oh on Audible. Oh my gosh. Now you too can learn no exactly joke. how to put that ne poop blood in the back seat to use on your way to work. The Tie in. Necronomicon in all seriousness, a novel really Audible. worth checking out is Edwin Abbott's Flatland, a book about life in an entirely two-dimensional universe, heard about and this. it is a trip. Trust me. You can get your first yeah, audiobook free along be. with two selected Audible original titles and exclusive fitness programs when you start your 30-day trial. Just visit audible.com slash salmonella or text salmonella to 500 500 to get started. Audible.com slash salmonella or text salmonella to 500 500 to get started. Audible.com slash text salmonella to 500 500 to get started. Again, it still looks like go to audible.com slash S-A-M-O-N-E-L-L-A or text S-A-M-O-N-E-L-L-A to try Audible for free. Link in the description. Anyway, that's all for today. Until next time, I'm Sam and Ella, and thank you for watching. smash the desk. <laughs> Distorted the audio a little bit, but okay. Okay, so those were definitely... I, I had not heard of each of these stories. I knew that there was some weird going on with the Pope John Paul II, but I didn't know enough details, but now I know a lot more details. But all these stories were unfamiliar to me, but it did open me to a new side of what people have done with cadavers and corpses before. It's some really weird stuff. It's... it's very weird. And this guy has very simplistic um, I, w I wouldn't say animations, uh, it's probably more accurate to say animatic. This is probably closer to an animatic than it is an animation, but still, I mean, it it's very simple, but I, I like his way of storytelling. Um, not quite as refined as oversimplified, but he's definitely got something going. To be fair, this is from 2019, so this is from a few years ago. He may have honed his craft a little bit more, but I don't necessarily know for sure. The history of cadavers and corpses and the, the general study of anatomy over the centuries, especially from about like the late, I want to say the late 1700s onward, really fascinating stuff. Again, some of it can be morbid, but I still, once again, recommend this book. See it? Stiff. The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers by Mary Roach. This is an excellent read for anybody who might be fascinated in some of this stuff. If you watch all these video, if you watch both of these videos all the way through without too much of an issue, this book will be fine. Trust me. And it's it's not quite as humorous. There are some little jokes that are placed here and there, but there's so many stories, and there are certainly plenty of morbid tales in it, but. There's a lot of information and truth that most people don't think about when it could because nobody wants to talk necessarily about cadavers and dead bodies. 
Nobody wants to talk about, you know, a body that's been decomposing in their yard for how many years and they had no idea it was there because it was buried by the previous tenant who tried to keep it, uh, everything all hush-hush or some nonsense like that. No, nobody wants to think about that stuff. Nobody wants to talk about it. Understandably so. They're just some, uh, I'd say, gross topics, but it's, it's not even that. It's dark, disturbing, morbid stuff that people don't normally like to think about. They see it dramatized in all kinds of forensic TV shows from the likes of CSI, NCIS, some abbreviations, uh, Bones, Rizzolian Isles. I mean, they're even Law and Order to an extent. There are so many dramatized versions that have desensitized people to what actually happens. Not just on a regular basis, but even the weird stuff like in these videos. It's weird. People do absolutely weird things. Some people are just flat out not sane. Some people take it to extremes. Some people do, they morally corrupt themselves and other people find ways around moral corruption. I, it's, it, it's really wild stuff, but I appreciate, I, I would have loved to hear more stories about these kinds of things. I mean, I'm partially biased because I love topics like this. It's really fascinating stuff, but it was cool to hear some stories that I never really heard before and to hear some of these details. And, you know, he, he did have a little bit of a sense of humor and, you know, simple animatics, but they provided plenty of information and they were, they were enjoyable to listen to. <laughs> it was enjoyable to hear about hijinks regarding dead bodies over the years slash centuries. Don't read into that too much. My major is forensic science. I have a bachelor's degree in forensic science. I cannot be judged. <laughs> Hey there guys, thanks so much for watching this analysis and commentary on this Salmonella video. I wanted to quickly shout out my patrons, thank every single one of you for the support. Anybody who signs up gets early access to videos, gets exclusive sneak peeks to all different kinds of video and art projects, and plenty more, so please consider signing up if you haven't already. But otherwise, thanks so much to the people who do currently support me, your support means a lot. So thanks so much and I hope you guys enjoyed this video.